Thank you, Marjorie. Good morning. morning. If you can please stand and join in the call to worship. Rejoice always. Let us sing for joy to the Lord, the rock of our salvation. Pray continually. Let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. Give thanks in all circumstances. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. You'll bow your heads in prayer. God, our maker, creator, provider, and savior, we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. As we enter this time of worship and this Thanksgiving week, we give you thanks for all the good gifts you have given us. You are good, and we thank you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn will be number 96, We Plow the Fields and Scatter. You may be seated. Our giving to God is an offering of thanks for what God has provided us. Let us give today as an act of thanksgiving to God. Today we're giving our special offering to the Church of the Global Mission Fund. We are thankful for our churches of the brethren in 11 countries, including places like Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Brazil, and Nigeria. Our offering today will help support work in those and other nations. You may give through your regular offering in the offering plate, 
your special offering to the Church of the Brethren Mission Fund and the service cup in the, bank of, in the back of the sanctuary. You can also give to either fund through the Tithely app or our website, nettlecreekchurch.org. Today's scripture will be Matthew 16, 12 through 20. Then they, under, then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. When Jesus came to the region of Caesar Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind in earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose in earth will be loosed in heaven." Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was Christ. Thank you, Marcia, and thank you, Marjorie, thank you, Sally. And our tech team back there, Peter, Mel, Leland, thank you all. Appreciate it. So good morning. <clears throat> well, have you ever been on a losing team? Whether it was a sports team, a family game, anything. Like my current fantasy football team, which is 2-8. and eight. I am in last place, 10th place in my current fantasy football league. Thank you, Robert Carpenter, for getting me involved in that league. <laughs> so I'm in last place in that league. But the, what I take solace in is this. I'm better than the Lions, who are 0, 8, and 1. So you can go ahead and put that picture up if you want. The Detroit Lions, this was on Facebook this week, and I saw it, and I thought, this is a good meme. I really like it. So Lions have a history of being losers, okay? They've never even made it to the Super Bowl, all right? The last time they won the championship was before the Super Bowl existed in the 50s. So they've never even made it to the Super Bowl. The farthest they've gotten is to the NFC Championship game where they got pummeled, all right? But this is a meme, okay? Because last week, they didn't lose. They tied. So that's why it says, this is about bandwagon fans, right? So sometimes, like, people get really on board with a team when they're winning, and then when they're losing, they don't care. So if you were a Lions fan when we were projected to go 0-17, which would have been a new record this year because they added a game. There were 16 games, and guess who was the first team to go 0-16? The Lions. So they could have been the first team to also go 0-17, And they blew that by tying last week. So if you weren't a Lions fan, we were projected to go 0-17. Don't talk to me when we go 0-16-1, okay? So, like, don't jump on board just because we tied now a game. Now, I'm going to tie this back into the first year Karen and I were married. We got married in December of 07. But the following year, the fall of 08, was the first full football season that we had since being married. And I, we lived in Michigan, and I said, you know, I like to watch the Lions on Sunday. Can you watch the Lions with me? So, okay, yeah, we'll watch it. That was the year. They went 0-16, and, and they lost every single game. And at the end of that year, Karen's like, I'm not watching football anymore. I don't like it anyway, and the Lions always lose. Like, what, what's the point? So, and my kids are saying to me, Dad, here's the reason your fantasy football team loses. 
you put lions on your team, okay? That's, what do you expect? And then I thought, this year I'm going to do it differently. I'm not going to fill it with lions this year. So I didn't. But they said, you still have the name, Lion Kings. You got to get rid of, just get them out of your, to completely, just separate from the lions, okay? So this, this Thursday is their big game. I call it their Super Bowl because it's Thanksgiving. They play every year. 1934, first NFL football game on Thanksgiving was Detroit Lions, Chicago Bears, and the Lions have always hosted a with a few exceptions in between there, always hosted. And the NFL hates it because people tune out by halftime because they're always losing by a lot. But it's their Super Bowl. Since they never make it to the Super Bowl, it's all about Thanksgiving Day. So we'll see how it goes this Thursday. If they win one game for the year, that'll be it, and that'll be a big deal for Lions fans. But here's my point. <laughs> You're saying, where are you going with all of this? Have you been on a losing team? Have you been associated with a losing team? How did it feel to be part of a losing team? Whether it was football or one of your games at home that you play, maybe it's a board game, maybe it's Monopoly, maybe you're a Euchre player. I've never won at those either. Maybe it was a high school team, a little league team, family game. When you lose a lot or you expect to lose or you're on a losing team, you can feel discouraged. Maybe like, I'm quitting, I'm giving up, I don't care anymore, I'm on this losing team. And I wonder sometimes if this is how we feel once in a while when it comes to the church, either a local church or the big church. Do we sometimes feel like, well, we're just on the losing team? Like, it's not having an impact like I want it to. Like, we're just Lions fans, all right? I'm loyal, I'm faithful, but we're not really on the winning team. It seems that sometimes the church is not having the impact we want it to have, either locally or internationally. But I want us to turn the corner today and see the real picture. Because if we feel that way, that is not accurate. Satan, of course, wants us to feel that way. He is the ultimate discourager. And anytime we are feeling discouraged, Satan is behind it in some way. But Jesus here in the scripture reading today in Matthew 16, talking to his disciples, says an amazing statement in verse 18. He says, I will build my church. And the second half of this is really important. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In other words, they won't win. I will build my church and my church will win. I will build my church and my church will be victorious. I will build my church and we will be the winning side. Satan and Hades and hell and the demons and the world won't stop it. That doesn't mean they won't put up a fight. That doesn't mean he won't allow hardships and difficulties and challenges for the church to go through. He just means at the end of the day, this is the winning side. Satan will lose. Jesus and his church will win. We're on the winning team. And if you know you're on a winning team, you take a different attitude. When you're on a team that wins, you have enthusiasm and excitement and energy. I've been on that side too. When I was a boy, the Tigers won the World Series in 1984. The Pistons won back-to-back -back championships in 89 and 90. The Red Wings won back-to-back -back in 97 and 98. There was a season when I grew up as a child, except for the Lions, <laughs> When the people of Detroit were pretty excited about their sports teams, the 80s and 90s, and you would see the banners, and you would see the flags, and you'd see people wearing the jerseys, and they were excited about it. For this area, maybe you can think of the Colts in 2007, IU in 81, the Reds in 1990. These were winning teams. And I want to remind you to have enthusiasm, incitement, and energy about the church because we're on the winning team. We're not on the losing team. 
And if you're on the winning team, again, people have excitement, energy, and enthusiasm about that. People can't wait till the game day. And they study the team throughout the week, and they wave the flags. And this is the type of attitude I want us to remember for the church, that we're on the winning team, that we can be energized and excited about, that we can study what's going on with the church because it's the victors. Every championship team faces adversity. Every championship team faces hardships. Every championship team faces struggles. And when they win anyway, that's often the part that makes it special. It's not as special sometimes if you go and play a team that just is terrible and you beat them by a lot. (laughs) I've been on the other side of that too. I remember when Central Michigan University played the University of Florida in football when I was going to school there. Final score, Florida 82, Central Michigan 6. Okay, they should not have been on the same field. (laughs) But that's not that fun for Florida. I don't think Florida left that game thinking, yeah, awesome, we're great. We beat this team 82 to 6. But when you're playing someone who's tough and you're playing someone who's challenging and you're playing somebody who's difficult and you beat them anyway and it was hard and you went through hardship and you suffered and you had to put the extra in and then somehow you pulled it out, those are the games that have a whole lot more meaning to it. And it's interesting that Jesus seems to see the same thing through his church. He's never said we won't have adversity. He's never said we won't have challenge. He's never said we won't have trials. Never said he won't allow the evil one to have influence and make it difficult and make it challenging. And when we think about brothers and sisters around the world, like those in Nigeria and those in Haiti and those in some other places that have faced a lot of serious challenge and come through on the other side, it's awesome to see how God has worked through that. And if we read through the whole New Testament, it's set against the backdrop of persecution. The whole New Testament is about the church being persecuted, but coming through anyway with Jesus as Lord. So I'm calling this series God's Victorious Church. And I'm starting today, the last Sunday of the church calendar, before we start Advent, which traditionally has been known as Christ the King Sunday, meaning... Christ is king, Christ reigns, and Christ will win. He will reign victorious. I will build my church. So here's what I want you to see today. Jesus says, I will build my church. Well, how does Jesus build his church? I want to show you five things that Jesus does to build his church. First, he builds his church with people who confess Jesus as Lord. Let's look back to verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? This is the key question all of us has to answer in life. It's actually the most important question in life. Who do you say Jesus is? The most important question in life. Your answer to that will determine everything else in life. Who do you say Jesus is? So he starts out asking, who do others say that I am? Some say, and in our culture we could say, who do other people say Jesus is? Some say, if you listen to other people, He's a good man, a good teacher of good morals. Some say he's a prophet of God or maybe a martyr. Some say he's a fictional character. He was created just as someone to help us learn about good things. Some say he was a good man who did good things and then he became a legend. His legend just grew. But these stories aren't actually what happened. Some would say he's a false prophet, a false messiah, and bad for us. 
But who do you say that Jesus is? So he turns to Peter and turns to the disciples. What about you? Who do you say I am? Peter answers, verse 16, you are the Christ, which is also translated the Messiah. The Greek is Christ, Hebrews Messiah. You are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God, the Son of the living God. And that's the answer all of us needs to come to. Do we believe he's the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God? If so, by our confession of faith, we are part of the church. He builds his church with people who confess Jesus as Lord. And if you don't believe Jesus is Lord, then you're not part of the church. You may physically be part of the church, but spiritually you're not connected to Jesus if you don't believe that he's the Lord, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Romans 10.9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the key confession everyone needs to make. And by confession, I'm talking about agreeing with God. I'm not talking about confession of sin here. I'm talking about confession of truth. You're confessing, yes, Jesus is Lord. You're confessing he rose from the grave. Obviously, Peter couldn't say that second part yet at this point because he hadn't risen yet. But once he did, he did. But he recognized he was uniquely the Son of God. He recognized he was uniquely the Messiah, the answer. Verse 17 gives us some insight into this. God has a part in this. We can't come to this decision on our own. Verse 17, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was revealed to you not by man, but by my Father in heaven. In other words, God has to open people's eyes to this truth. We can't just convince people that this is true. Because if apart from God, they'll come up with all the other answers. Good man, legend, fictional, bad for us, martyr, prophet. But they can't come up with this until God opens their heart and mind to it. And that's why prayer is so important for people that we know and love to help their minds and hearts to be open to receive this from God. But everyone who confesses this then becomes part of the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 talks about at the moment of our confession of faith, we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. Baptized means immersed or placed in. So we are immersed or placed in one body by the Holy Spirit, by our faith in Jesus. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, doesn't matter. We're all placed in that body and given one spirit to drink. And Jesus now says that on these people, I will build my church. Which leads me to number two. The church is built with living people, not a physical building. Yes, we may call this the church because that's where the church meets. It's set apart for that reason. But the church is people, and he is building with people. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. Look, the living stone. The living stone is Jesus. But the key word there is living. He's using building imagery to help you see that this is being built, but it's a living being, Jesus. And then verse 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. God is building his church with living people, not a physical building. Ephesians 2, 21 and 22 tells us this as well. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together. You, individual people, are being built together. We, individual people, are being built together. That's the church. So it's made up of living people, but not just individuals on their own. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to build individual lives who will love me and know me. He said, I'm going to build the church, individuals who are built together. So if people ask, is the church essential? The answer is yes, because that's what Jesus is building. He's building his church. So the church is essential because that's what he's building. This is Jesus' building project. 
Now, the next one. Number three, the church is built with Jesus as the chief cornerstone and the head, Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Everything is built from Jesus. Jesus is the one that holds it all together. Ephesians 5.23 puts it this way. talks about marriage between husbands and wives. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is the Savior. So Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the head. Now number four. Let's go back to Ephesians 2.20. With apostles and prophets like Peter as foundations. You want to pull that one up, Ephesians 2, 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. There's always been this debate, and part of it is because of the Catholic-Protestant divide. When he says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, is he talk, what is he talking about? What's this rock? On this rock I will build my church. Well, Peter, his name means rock, and Jesus took Simon and said, I'm calling you Peter now. And I'm building my church on this rock. Well, does that mean Peter or does that mean the confession of faith or does that mean something else? Of course, the Catholic tradition has said, yes, Peter, and then the apostolic succession from him. And the Protestants said, no, because we don't agree with the apostolic succession, so it's going to be the confession of faith. I say both, but I say Peter is one of the apostles and one of the prophets that lay the foundation, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So Jesus, the chief cornerstone, and now the apostles, and now the prophets are laying the foundation. What is the New Testament? The New Testament is the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, Acts 2.42 in the early days of the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. There's other things they devoted themselves to. But they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. It was the apostles who laid the foundation of the church with their teaching. It was the apostles and the prophets who wrote the words of the New Testament. So in a way, yes, it was on the rock of Peter and the other apostles that God built the foundation of the church on. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, preached the message and 3,000 people came to the church. Peter also went to Samaria in Acts 8 and laid hands on the Samaritans so they could receive the Holy Spirit. Peter also was summoned to uh, the Gentile in Acts 10 and gave the message Cornelius, and he heard and received the Holy Spirit. Acts 15, Peter was there at the council when they made the decisions of how they would accept the Gentiles. So in a way, in the whole first half of Acts, Peter is instrumental in everything that happens to move the church from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the Gentiles. So in a way, he does play a very key role. He's very instrumental but again, Peter himself is not the chief cornerstone. That's Jesus. But he's one of the apostles, one of the prophets that God builds the foundation on. Number five, God builds his church with a role in binding and loosing on the earth. In other words, what the church does matters for how God's kingdom comes on the earth. There's two scriptures I want to point to here and then kind of Pull this back together. So Romans 10, 13, 17 says, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they going to call on the name of the Lord? This is the question, 14. How can they call on one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So Jesus talks in Matthew 16 about, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's a connection between heaven and earth through the church. 
And people can't come into the kingdom and people can't be saved if the church isn't proclaiming the message for the people to get saved. So people can't get loosed from their bondage and people can't get loosed from the chains until they receive the message of the gospel. And they can't receive the message of the gospel if someone doesn't tell them the message of the gospel. So he says, I'm giving you the keys here, and I want you to use those keys to loose people so they can receive. Keep going, verse 15. And how can they preach unless they are sent? And again, the word apostle means a sent one. So God was calling his apostles as sent ones into the world. And now he calls the church as his sent ones into the world to proclaim the message, as is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. 16, not all the Israelites accepted the good news. So not everyone received it, but they were all to hear it. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message, verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. So until the message is proclaimed, you can't believe it. But once the message is proclaimed, then you can. And the role of the church has a role of binding and loosing on the earth. They have a role of loosing people from the chains of darkness. They have a role of loosing people from the chains of sin by proclaiming the good news of the salvation offered in Christ. Now we'll look at the other side of the binding and loosing, but both, that both actually come out through this. This is in Matthew 18. This is just a couple chapters later than Matthew 16. Jesus connects these things. Matthew 18, 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, this is something that a lot of us don't like to do, but it is a plan of God to help us to live in the freedom and being loosed from the chains of sin in our lives. There's a key word here, sins. That's what this is about. This scripture can be used yeah, for other things, but it's about sin. It's not about someone just rubs you the wrong way, you don't like them. <laughs> That's forbearance. You're just supposed to forbear with people who rub you the wrong way and you don't like them. Make decisions you don't like. This is someone sinning. If someone sins against you, go and show them his fault just between the two of you. The goal is to get that person to repent of their sin and walk in righteousness, right? And if he listens to you, you've won your brother over. What have you done again? You've loosed them from the chains so they can walk in freedom. I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. And one of the ways to use that is when you see your brother in sin, you go help him get out. 16, but if he will not listen, go back to that, please, 16. If he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's an Old Testament principle. But again, take a couple others along and say, look, we really want to get you free. We don't want to keep you living in this bondage. We want you loosed. Now, 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. I don't think that means like Sunday morning joys and concerns. <laughs> but I think this means you, you have a special time where you gather the believers together and say, look, I've tried as an individual, we've tried together, but we need to come together now and try to help this brother to get free or this sister to get free because they're still living in this sin and they won't get out of it. Tell it to the church who refuses to listen even to them. Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And then look at this very next phrase, the exact same thing he says in Matthew 16. Whatever you bind on earth, we bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, be loosed in heaven. In other words, at that point, and this is old school, brethren, I know, but there is some ways of trying to understand why they would even say this. There may come a point where you say, for a while, we can't consider you a member of this church. We have to bind you <laughs> because you're refusing to repent. And then when you're ready to repent, treat him as a tax collector or a pagan. In other words, we'll treat you as an unbeliever until you're ready to come back and know Jesus and follow his plan for your life. 
And when you do, you'll get loosed. <laughs> but for a while, there may be a time we have to say, look, I, I can't treat you as a full member of the church right now because you're refusing to live the way Christ wants you to live. That's the idea of loosing and binding as I understand it. So put all that together now. I want you to see here that Jesus is building his church. It wins. <laughs> I want you to end with that today. The church wins. Jesus is Lord. He is King. So our action steps today, number one, if you have not already, confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That is how you become part of his church. Secondly, I encourage you, commit to making church a top priority for the Advent season. Basically from now till the end of the year. Why? Because Jesus is building his church. And if you want to get on board with Jesus and his plan, then the church is a priority. Because that's what he's building. And then thirdly, pray about what God would have you contribute to the life of the church in 2022. What's your part in God building his church? We'll talk more in this coming year about being a body. We'll talk more in this coming year about specific roles and gifts and all those things. But I want you to see right now that God does have a role for all of us to contribute to the life of his church. And it won't be in vain because the church wins. Just like any team, every member of the team has a role. Every role matters. At the end, when they win the championship, they all get a ring. They don't say, well, you didn't play enough to get a ring. <laughs> Your role was too minor. You weren't the MVP. They all celebrate together the victory, and they all get a ring. And I believe at the end of our time, that we go into eternity, we all get a crown for our role in the championship team of the church. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Here's the celebration for being part of my team. Let's pray together. God, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for being our God and being our Savior and being our King. And God, I pray today that we would be excited and enthusiastic about your church because we know that's the winning team. And we know that there are good things ahead even when we face hardships or difficulties or challenges or times when it doesn't look like things are going as well. We know that's still just the middle of the game or the middle of the season. It's not the end. We know at the end what the outcome is going to be. So help us, God, to figure out what our role is and where you want us to contribute to that. God, if we're not in the church, I pray that today we would become part of it by saying yes to Jesus, that you are our Lord and you are our Savior. We are repent of going our own way and go your way. If we are in the church and there are sins that we're dealing with and we need to be loosed from those, God, I pray that we would repent of those. If there are people we know who are in that situation and we need to talk to them, I pray, God, you would help us to have the courage and the boldness to be able to help them to get loosed. God, we honor and praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to end today now by singing together number 94 as we head into our Thanksgiving week. Come, ye thankful people.
So be blessed this week by Jesus Christ, the head of the church, who reigns victorious.